Hello everyone. It has been quite some time since our last tea talk. So uh, because there are quite a few things to catch up with, I brought today one of my Kung Fu friend. This is, uh, I think you want to introduce yourself. I am uh, Sifu Linden, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, my school is near Amsterdam in a place called Horn. I've been studying Kung Fu ever since I was nine years old. Done several different styles. I'm 46 now and I'm still learning, still improving every day and I'm still stronger than I ever was. I'm still increasing my energy and I feel more healthy, not only in the body but also in the mind. So, especially the last years when I've been training on the Master Yacht Bo Hong. He's a very special teacher and he has brought a lot of uh, depth into my life and a lot of uh, good things that I want to share with the people of the world. So that's why I try to teach as many people as I possibly can. Yes. So maybe for the ones that don't know how this connection between us uh, started to evolve, I guess it was 2019 when we met in Thailand. This is also where I got introduced the first time to your master, Master Yako Hong. And also in that sense to the five ancestor Kung Fu. And in this field of Shaolin martial arts, sooner or later I think there's no way around than to realize there is such a huge field yes. of practice. Now before you practiced the Five Ancestor Kung Fu, uh, what, what type of system, for example, did you practice before that? I used to train uh, when I was a kid, uh, some sort of uh, Shaolin Kung Fu, they, my teacher called it, which was a very traditional style with the weapons, the spear, the sword and everything. And then you look at the Kung Fu movies and then you see like a master touch the student and you fly away, but you never learn that type of thing. Then. For fighting, we can use like sandal or kickboxing. So then, when I was 16, I also started to kickboxing. Uh, I learned boxing, I did some MMA. Then I was about, I think, 32 or 33 years old, where I realized that this external heart training and getting bruised every day wasn't the way to go to get old and stay healthy. So I went looking, then I got also two daughters. Um, which I wanted to teach how to protect themselves, but you don't learn then your daughter how to box or how to kickbox, how to do it, keep them a pretty face. So then I hear about the Kung Fu style called Wing Chun. It was designed by a woman for a woman, so I think if I learn that, I can teach my daughters. So I started studying that style uh, to teach them. So I found out already that most Wing Chun is very used, very external, and I found that there might be something that could be added to it, that might make it more uh, effective. So I went looking internal, and then I found Master Yapo Hong, who is uh, also uh, a teacher in Wu Mei. And Wu Mei is actually Nung Yu, which is the one that invented the Wing Chun system according to the legend. So I studied her style and got in touch with the five ancestors. And I found that that, for me, was the way to go. It has so much depth, and also the internal, part that made me much more strong because uh, I was physically, I still am, physically way stronger than Master Yap. But the two finger, he just controlled me and throw me everywhere. So I was thinking like, okay, the physical power is one thing, but what he is doing is something special and I wanted to learn that. So now, it was 2014, now it's 2022, I'm still following him. And it's amazing what we can do. It's not only he can do it, but I can do it and my students can do it. So it's not like one person can do it. You all can do it because it's a system that you can pass on. Okay. So now that you were talking, you mentioned also already there's some external training that we name it like this. There are also internal aspects of training. So just for the ones that maybe don't have a relation, what is internal, what is external, are there any characteristics where you would say this is what we call external? And this is when we are talking about internal practices. This is what we are dealing in that, in that field. So how would you maybe describe it to someone who maybe never had any experience between this? Yes, it's a good question because usually when you start to train the physical aspects and up to a certain age, it's very good to train the 
the hard physical uh, uh, part, which I think is necessary uh, even. At one point, the difference between the internal and external, according to the definition, is that the external, you move the outside of the body to find what's moving on the inside. Once you find what's moving on the inside, you can move the inside of the body and then let the energy flow through and you move. So external would be moving the outside, internal would be I move the inside and then I shoot out the power. So it's a different way of dealing with energy, but the definition is move the inside to move the outside. That would be internal. Now, I think when we started to also slowly introduce in the Western world this concept or this idea of energy, it was not so easy to uh, tell or to try even to describe what we mean by energy. So let's just assume somebody really does not have any gloom, has does not have any experience when it comes to this term of energy. Yeah, we say, I mean, for, for martial art practitioners, if you say you move internally first and then afterwards you just express it with the body, I think a martial artist should be able to know what it means. But the point of why nowadays I think we also share many of these different methods, it's also that we're sharing it with people that maybe have nothing to do in the martial art field. Yeah, but nevertheless, at least I think that having access to what we call the internal energy or the energy itself does not only benefit uh, you when you're making martial arts because at the end it's just about understanding your body in a more efficient way and stop wasting energy which is just running off. Yes. yes. Yeah. And therefore what is like your, your approach, let's say, how do you get the idea of energy closer to a person? So we distinguish six different types. The first type is more known by everybody. It's like you use your muscles, you squeeze them, and try to throw your fists out of it using pure the strength of the uh, squeezing of the muscle. At one point, when you really squeeze your muscle hard and you stop squeezing, you can feel there's a release of something. You're storing energy or power or energy, however you want to call it. And then when you stop squeezing, you feel there's a release of something. Just like you pull the rubber band, you store energy, you let go and it will shoot away. So that I would describe as an energy. You, you store it somewhere, you, you, you generate it, then you let go. So that will bring us into the second level of what we call energy. The first one is you to squeeze the muscle. The second one would be the action to reaction force or kinetic and potential energy. So we have tendons in the body. The tendons are very elastic, so you can like squeeze your tendons and then you store the energy, then when you stop squeezing you can just let it out, unless you squeeze your muscle and you stop yourself from bringing it out. So that would be a very basic way to describe the uh, energies and the most people work with. Also Newton's law explains a lot uh, that in terms of how we can use energy, like the, the pull of the earth, the gravity, the air pressure, there's a lot of forces already being acted upon us. So by not resisting those forces, but allowing them to pass through the body, you need to be able to relax the muscle, so your bone skeleton and your tendons can let this energy flow through. So for me it's a very hard concept to explain um, to people that don't train, because you must experience this flow. But the simple way of describing, storing and releasing energy is you make a jump, just a simple jump, you press down, you press on the floor and you fly up. So you are storing energy and you let this power go up. But you can also choose to let this power go through the body, not waste it by the, by the jump, but let it go and bring it to the fist. So that would be a simple way to explain what is energy for me. And there are different types of internal energy, which maybe we'll go in later. But the most simple way to explain is the action-reaction force. Like Newton say, for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. Okay. But now, if we talk about the application of these practices for us in the field of martial arts, but where do you think would be like the benefit? Also for people, they never want to hit somebody. They're not about going out to competition. 
but more and more people they are becoming interested, for example, especially in the in the beginning, the obviously slow moving arts. There is something about the way to move slow. And sometimes I think it is in the Kung Fu area which is called if you cannot do it slow, you can't do it fast. Correct, correct. And now especially uh, when I was also like training with you and Master Bo for uh, some time, you're also extremely aware and alert of whatever you are doing there. Yes. So in the field of martial arts, now also being like inside the Buddhist monastery, having the terms of meditation, having the terms of awareness, having the terms of mindfulness. So when you hear these words, uh, what do they mean to you and also especially for the practice? How important is it to be mindful, to be aware? So basically, you, like the mindfulness is a, is a word that's used a lot, but it's actually being aware of what is happening. It's like when you push on the floor, what do you notice that is happening? Is the floor pushing you back up? Um, am I tensing my, my, my fist? Can I open it? Many people, they stress, they walk like this. I used to be one of them. At one point it's like, you're lifting so much power, so much weight. When you notice, you must let go, but you don't know how to let go. Well, letting go is actually stop holding on. So you have to catch yourself, be mindful, train yourself, am I tensed? Yes, let go. So this is the start of mindfulness that people can do now at home. If you notice yourself being tense, or some people have the habit of shaking on the couch, you know, catch yourself, ask yourself, well, why am I doing this? It's because you're tensed. So what do you do with tension? Stop holding on to it. If there's a thought you know, in your mind that keeps bugging you, why do you keep thinking it? What's, what's behind that thought? that keeps you doing this. That is part of mindfulness. You try to find out what is bothering me and how can I let it go. So in terms of martial arts, what we practice with the slow moving is actually a, a standing or an active standing meditation. So you try to find out what happens if I lower my weight? Do I feel the energy come up? If I feel it, where can I place it? Can I bring it in? Can I bring it down? Can I just let it flush through my body? So this is what the mindfulness comes in, and by the slow movement, it's not boring at all. You try to feel and find out what's going on. It's not like, oh my God, this move takes five minutes to go up. Or, what am I feeling? What am I noticing? What's going on? So that is a big difference, how the mindfulness comes in. Then something is called embodiment, because you can have all this knowledge. You know, many people can read many books. But before you really understand it, you must embed it into your body by practicing it a lot and a lot and a lot. And of course, it really helps if you have a good teacher that can show you, let you feel, and then guide you in the process. Because if not, it's a lot of guesswork. And the guesswork takes a lot of time because when you find it, it's mostly by accident. The teacher can just tell you, do this, do this, notice this, okay, I let you feel this. Then it comes more in the body, then you get a real mindfulness and not like fantasy. So you have to always be careful. Am I mindful or is this fantasy? Thank you very much. Now, before you met uh, Master Yapo, how many years did you practice before? Uh, I started martial arts when I was nine, that was 1984, 1985. I met Master Yap in 2014. So I've been practicing quite a while. And for the last eight years, I've been with Master Yap, and that's a total different, total different world. Like I said before, it's more like guessing. And you get the information, but usually the information is not fully correct, or there's like loss because of the language barrier between the one explaining it to you and the one receiving it. So I've been training a long, long time. And I feel the training before, I misunderstood a lot of it. But it is not wasted years because now with the new understanding, everything I learned before, I can make work. So, you have also spent quite some time in the martial arts field, so 30 years and longer. Yeah. In the moment where you met your master and you realized what he is able to give you there. 
how did it feel for you? It was amazing. It was like you found a new dimension of possibilities that you never had possible. But when I was young, I was looking at the martial arts movies and I saw all these cool things happening, like the massive touches to let me fly away. And I wanted to learn that all my life. And finally, after so many years, more than 30 years, I finally found it and I felt it and I experienced it. And this is real. I tried everything I could. I couldn't stop him from doing it. So at that point, I was so, so happy that I just spent a whole month and spent it with him in Malaysia and learned and learned and learned. And ever since, I've seen him so as much as I can, three months a year. And yeah, whatever chance I get, I travel with him and I learn and learn and learn. It's like, it's like finally finding the, like the, the treasure like you've been all your life looking for and gave up on. So for me, that was like really awesome. And then I also made it my mission to share this with the world because this knowledge, this information must be shared. It cannot be kept a secret anymore because you know, it's dying. If we don't spread it now, it gets lost. So that's why it's also my mission to spread this and teach it to the people that really want to learn. Of course, there's skeptic people. Of course, you do whatever you think is nice and makes you happy. But for the people that want to learn, you know, we are here. So we want to share it and if you have a good heart and a good mind, we love to teach you. Okay. So, do you think it would have been possible that you meet this master without all the effort and the continuation of your personal practice all the years before? Because sometimes, how I see it in this field, many people are getting to some type of knowledge. But sometimes it takes quite a lot, a lot of years. So it's absolutely like a present from the universe if you meet someone where you recognize in that person he has something that you've been searching for for such a long time. But sometimes I also have the feeling that, especially in nowadays world, that it's almost like... that it almost feels like common sense for the people to straight away get to that type of knowledge that nowadays seems to be so easily accessible. So the point is just at the same time of sharing all these methods. This is also why we are having all these conversations, why we are keeping on meeting up. But at the same time it's also important for everyone who is then receiving this type of teaching to also understand that the only reason why nowadays it's possible that some people are able to share this is because a lot of lifetime, a lot of dedication and a lot of commitment and a lot of sacrifices uh, have went into the lives of these individuals. So maybe you can also just share from your side what other hobbies do you have besides the martial arts? <laughs> Uh, actually, man, I forced myself to sometimes try and do other things. So I started like making knives, and then I started I'm learning that. I'm also always applying martial arts stuff. It's like I, when I sharpen the knives and I put my fingers and I try to feel the sensitivity and I move like from the feet. So I still practice martial arts if I do that. My whole life is martial arts. Uh, I live inside my kung fu gym. Everything I do is martial arts based and I really have to force myself to try and do something else another time. So for me this is my life. And the people that have also been training for many years and coming across this, they are the ones that appreciate it the most because they have also seen the way and they have also looked for, for it for all their lives and basically given up. Then you show somebody that just come along and started this, they usually don't even know how special it is what they get. But to me it's like I'm smiling and I give them a present, even though they don't know the value now, they, they will one day. <laughs> so yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yes, but yes, yes. Uh, it's a lot of sacrifice, I lost many things, but I found something very really valuable and I really feel it's important to share it. And uh, I mean, you already look like a strong guy, you are a strong guy. You practice a strong art, but just out of curiosity, do you think there is some connection between the stability, also like the emotional stability, the mental stability of a person nowadays, if it has any type of connection to actually what you are practicing? So how much impact did your personal martial art journey have on 
the way how you are standing nowadays on on this earth. Yeah, probably would have been dead long ago. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like uh, up to 2010, I lived a uh, very stressful life, uh, job very demanding, two burnouts. Uh, cannot enjoy life. Have a lot of money. Have a nice car. Have a nice house, but no happiness. So after the second burnout, I, and during actually, I found that the breathing I learned from Kung Fu really helped me and calmed me down. And actually nothing could help me but except for what I learned from the Kung Fu. So at that point I was like, this stuff is valuable, I must find a teacher that can show me. So along the way, several people helped me. One is uh, Greg Yao from San Francisco, he really helped me a lot. And gave me a lot of information to help me restore myself. And then through the Facebook, uh, Ben Shu, the first student of Master Yap, he gave me a lot of information that also helped me. And during really bad times of my life, the only thing that helped me and stay up was the training, the practice, until I found out like how the relationship is between the body, the emotions, the, the thoughts, how you can center them and bring them to one place. And also learn how to change your consciousness by directing it from another place that you are used to. It's called the Shun. It's a very nice place to be and then everything started changing and changing and of course I'm still learning, I'm still human, you know, I still get angry, I still get upset. But then again, it's like, you know, that's life, it's all part of it. Uh, the most important part is to stop judging yourself and realize that you're on a road, it's going somewhere. And just try not to stand still, just try to travel the road and enjoy life. But that's what it brought to me and really the, the relationship between the body, the emotions and the mind that really needs to be connected together. And it's when you know what they call like oneness or centered or many ways to describe it, but it's really nice to, to get it. And you need the challenges because if you don't get challenged, you don't grow. It's like the jungle, you have trees, they compete for the light, they get so high. But if you put the same tree in a field that has enough light, it won't grow that high. So in a way you must be grateful and thankful for all these things that's happening so you can grow and reach a higher level. And through training that's what always kept me going. When I feel bad, I train, I feel good. No. Meanwhile there are so many different teachers, instructors, martial arts systems available freely. For example, if you just have time, you can find them all, mostly all on YouTube. And where would you say, or how would you say, somebody would be interested right now in just learning any type of art? The first question would be, do you think there is a superior art? And the second of all is, how would somebody start to actually approach and get on this journey um, to start discovering? What would you say would be the first steps for a student to search for the proper guidance or to search for the proper teacher? I think a lot has to do also with luck and destiny, that you find the right person at the right time. Um, because there's so much available, it's hard to say, because for me, of course, my own art that I practice is for me the most superior art, because it works for me. But it doesn't mean that it is the superior art for other people. So basically find something you really, really like, that you can put your heart in, you can put your passion in. And from that point, things will start happening. Uh, you will meet the right teacher at the right time. Because one time I, I was asking myself, like, all this knowledge I have now, what if I had it like 20 or 30 years ago? How good would I have been at this point? So I had this dream that I traveled back in time and I saw myself training. I was doing the boxing and knocking each other out. And I look at myself and I wanted to approach myself and I saw, no, no, this guy is not ready. He will just probably laugh at me and just try to hit me and that's it. And then I will put him on the floor and he will just say I cheated on him or I did some sort of crazy stuff. So I just left. That was my dream answering my question. That it will come when the time is right. When the apple is right, the right teacher will appear. So just start, do whatever you think it's, it's good, that makes you feel good, that makes you happy. And from that point, just travel the road. Mm. I think one thing that just like 
came up now listening to you. I think during this talk, very often you mentioned the word already happy, satisfied, calm, love, compassion. There are these type of area of, of words. Yes. Now, normally if we talk about martial arts, how to break a bone, how to break the neck, yeah, and, and things like this, it's extremely strange. Then at the same time, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> to hear them from the same persons that are actually teaching this type of art, but how does that, the compassion, the love, yes. the peace, how, how does this fit in there? Yes, it's, it's a strange thing because in the beginning I like hurting people. I hit somebody, I look in their eyes, to see the effect. I really enjoy it, like, like knocking people out during training, of course. Uh, that was how it was at that time. To one point I was sparring, I didn't feel the urge to hit back anymore, something changed inside me. So now also when I play with my students, they hit me, I can retaliate but I don't want to. I can break their bone if I want to, I can just show you, look, I got you now, I got you now, they cannot resist, but it's just a game to me. It's just playing, when I spar, it's for me, it's playing. Sometimes somebody tries to hurt me, I just give a little bit more power and see how far they can go, but I don't try to destroy or hurt them anymore. So this is a funny development that the mind changes, the spirit changes during the development. So for me, the biggest change started really with the, the Yan Shikong practice, the Five Ancestor practice. It really helped me calm down and of course Master Yap, he talked a lot to me and uh, gave me many opportunities and chances to, to learn mentally. Because at the end of the day it's all about the development of the mind. The mind is the most important thing, actually, and it will come at a, at a time because <laughs> I used to do it, yeah. I enjoyed hurting people at one point and I stopped liking it and I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. Now I'm at a point, uh, if I need to hurt you, I hurt you, if I don't, I don't. It's, it's quite simple. Yeah. But it's in, in, indeed a strange way, like I, I can break this, I can break this, I can take this, I can take this eye out. But, yeah. It's like you have a gun, you know, I can hit this target, I can hit that target, I can hit that target, but why do it? But it feels good to have the gun, if somebody comes, you can just shoot him. Same with this, I feel happy because I'm armed. If somebody comes, I can take care of the situation and I can da do damage up to what I want. So it's a, it's, it's a gift. Yeah, but there you just said, it's good to have it and probably not to use it. Yes. The thing is that you have it, but what I mean by that is, you know the hardness of the stuff. You know, you know the hard training, you know the sweating part, you know the sacrificing part, you know the part about tensioning up. So let's just say you know you have been very, very physical already in your past training. So you have been very, very physical. But now if we look in nowadays um, development a little bit, because health of course is uh, very much in the, in the foreground. So what looks healthy, definitely, is the slow movements, yes. the qigong movements, the round movements, the flowing movements. They look healthy, they are healthy. But what is oftentimes at the same time missing then is, if you only stick to this type of training. Yes. So which means you want relaxation, and yes, you can do relaxation movements. But what is missing there is what, for example, you already have the hardness before that. So now, if somebody is only sticking to the soft side of life, to the soft side of practices, to the gentle art of practices, what is your opinion on that? It's missing half. Because it's the yin-yang principle. Um, the old way is you start with the hard styles until you get older. As you get older, you are changing to the softer styles. So, you need, it's a progression. If you start with the soft cells, once you learn soft, you never want to go hard again. You need a certain amount of hardness and you must know what it is to be hurt, you must know what it is to be knocked down, you must know what it is to physically fight until you get ready to the point you want to let go of it. Uh, that is the old way, from the heart to the soft, to the spiritual. Uh, you cannot have one without the other. Well, can, but you will always be limited in some way. If you only practice hard, you will be limited. If you only practice soft, you will be limited. That's why the principle of being young is both. So to me, yeah, you need both. Um, of course, 
there's certain ways of doing the hardness. You can go into the extreme hardness, but you can also go in a more gentle way that fits more with you. But you need to go from hard to soft. Once you're soft, you never want to go back to hard. Mm -hmm. So that is how I see it. If you only practice one side of the coin, you're missing the other. So when people approach you, for example, let's say not the young students, a little bit middle-aged, a little bit older people, where they say that actually their purpose is they just want to become healthy again. Yeah. Um, how would you approach their training? What would you? What is like a way how you look at their body, or I don't know, how do you approach to see what is it? What type of methods are you giving to them? We, we do have like exercises, like the, the, the stretching ones, like the Bakwa Jin. It's also very powerful. It's a real workout. We have the, the stretches I learned from Master Dennis Wang uh, from Singapore, the 18 Kong. When you do it, it looks like nothing, but you really get like your breath starts going, so you get more powerful. So I teach the more old people, the elder, uh, well, the, 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 like middle aged people. I teach them, you know, they have to be able to do squats, they have to go, be able to go down and up, but of course they don't have to do 100 push-ups like the, the younger people, but according to their age, they still have to do some physical exercise to get the body strong enough, because the, the Lee, the first, the, the, the past part where you use the body muscle, must be developed to a certain level. If you're young, you can go to extreme level, but in middle age, you have, still have to develop some sort of power. And then as you really get older, like in your 60s, 70s, I still need to be able to squat down, at least. Yes. You need some of it. That's what I think. Okay. And now again to the field of energy. Yes. Let's just say somebody is practicing any type of energy practices. Mm -hmm. From the way of um, his talking, from what he's sharing on his mind, he probably or she feels very energetic. So the feeling of energy is there, the feeling of flow is there, the feeling of something is there. But where do you take, where is the threshold between somebody fantasizing about possessing energy and about that person really started cultivating energy? How do you see the difference? Uh, the way I see it is that we also have uh, this system of milestones. If you can demonstrate a certain skill and you can express the energy in a certain way, then you have reached the milestone. If you cannot demonstrate it, then it's still not there yet. So, for example, somebody say he's grounded. So a person that's grounded should be able to at least hold somebody that's pushing you. With moderate force, at least. So if you say somebody, oh, I'm very good at grounding, you push them and they fly away. They, they're not grounded. Simple as that. If somebody say you can ground their roots, bring the energy back up, so you give him some power. If you cannot bring it to the ground and give it back to you, he's not there yet. If somebody say I can project with my mind the energy, so you ask him, okay, you know, project it into my shoulder while they touch you and they cannot, they have not reached that level. So in my way, it's very simple. If you have reached a certain level, you should be able to at least demonstrate it, simple demonstration. It doesn't have to be extreme. You don't have to hold like three people pushing you, but at least you should hold someone that's leaning onto you. If you don't have that, then you don't have the ground. So we say no ground, no energy. Uh, no ye, you cannot move your energy. So that's simple ways to test if you have it or not. But if you never test yourself, then it's usually fantasy. No, to the ye, exactly. Some people may don't know ye sometimes translate as mind intent yes. or intention. Um, how can somebody understand what it is and how can it be developed? What's the purpose of, of the E and why does it make sense to take that, that category of, of perception into your practice? So, what is E for you? For me, the E is, is, is the mind you no know, saying what it wants to happen. Because the mind moves the energy, the he moves the energy, the energy moves the body. So everybody actually is using it like you have a piece of paper and you want to throw it in the bin. You aim with your intention, then you send the energy, you, you visualize it's going in and then you throw it. Then depending on how good your coordination is going in or not. That's the practice part. 
or you write down a word. You think of the word, the body starts writing it. But when you're learning the word, you have to go, okay, the letter K, then the next letter. But once you know the word, you just say, write the word, and the body starts writing. So we already have, every person has it. But can you really, like, guide it in any way you want? Uh, to me, the Yi is something that's most important in all of the training. Because the mind is really like the intention of the mind, or I say, I call it a strange way of willing something. You want it, but you don't want to force it out. You just will it and let it happen. Allow it to happen. Um, let's say somebody think of something sad, then he starts feeling sad. Something, somebody think of something happy, he starts feeling happy because the intention of the mind is setting the energy and setting the, in this case, the emotion, but can also do the body. So the concept of Yi is difficult to explain, but everybody has it. You just have to, to, to cultivate it and reach a level that you can control it. Not an easy concept, but yeah. once you experience it, it's, it's easier to, to feel. I think some time ago, I'm jumping maybe a little bit, but you were also invited to the Southern Shaolin Temple also to start sharing or bringing back actually the, the five ancestors, Kung Fu and teach it in the Southern Shaolin Temple. I was hearing something about this. You, can you share something? What you know? Yes. Well, I was invited to go there, but then, of course, COVID happened. So I'm not, I've not been there yet, but Master Master Yap has been there, and they are sharing because at one point the Shaolin Temple was destroyed, and most of the masses they went to Southeast Asia. And also, during a period of time in China, the Kung Fu and Buddhist practice was forbidden. So the temple just got rebuilt, I think, 2006 or 2008. And ever since, Master Yap has been there a few times to bring the Five Ancestors style, which is a, an old Shaolin style, back to the temple, so the monks can start practicing it again. Um, but personally, I have not been there yet. I did go to the South Shaolin Conference and met, meet the abbot of the South Sh uh, Temple and exchange a little bit of my training. But there's like two types of monks. You have the fighting monks and the spiritual monks. He's a spiritual monk. So uh, I would love to have like maybe you know do some kung fu with him, but at that point. But there were some some, some younger monks that did kung fu. They are pretty good. They're, they're really nice to see their their arts. So yes, uh, now that COVID is lifting, we hopefully can travel again, and I hope to see the South Shaolin Temple uh, yeah, and get some recognition also from there. That would be really nice. Yeah, and one a strange appearance in nowadays time somehow is that many of the arts, many of the methods that I also think that you are sharing, that Master Yapo Hong is sharing, that different masters are sharing. Initially, a few decades before, I actually thought that the place where I would actually find all these methods and teachings would be the temples itself. And so this is why I spent many, many years following also different masters, coming from this tradition uh, until also different encounters, different meetings, also the one in Thailand where we met and meanwhile also with other different masters just like lifted a little bit this veil from my eyes and that illusion from my eyes that this type of arts you find like in these so-called places. Yes. Yeah. But at the moment for my reality it's like this you don't need to look Chinese to know extremely a lot and have a lot of depths about what these arts are about. Yes, and it's a pity to say it in a way, but I think it's just one part also to let the people know. Uh, there, was, there were many discussions and there were many, <laughs> many comments you know, simply about the fact that my origins are not Chinese. Mm -hmm. you know, my origins are Vietnamese. Nevertheless, uh, we have built up the Shaolin Temple Europe, which nowadays is quite a big platform also to start sharing these arts. And it is just one of these messages that I would just like to send out and also why I really appreciate you being here and sharing all of this knowledge 
because it couldn't be more racist at all to limit the knowledge that people want to have just like based on the nationality that you have. And of course this is now nothing specifically related to, to the martial arts practice. Yeah? You might consider it being some political issues, but these things also exist in the field and are think and are part of um, are part of the daily things that also our organization is dealing with. Yeah, and the point is that from your personal travels, from all the masters that you know, that you personally know, that you have met in person. What is your opinion about that? Do you have to be originating from one of these countries to possess knowledge which is valuable to know? No, not necessarily. Most of the most of the people I met that really good, they are Chinese origin, but they're not from mainland China. Because the mainland China, a long time, everything has been suppressed and it was forbidden. So most of the people with skill, they moved outside of that. Um, of course, in Shanghai, there are a few very good uh, Tai Chi masters that I know of. Uh, they were friends with Masayoff's father. But it's very hard to say, you don't need to be uh, Chinese origin to be really good at the art. It's just to them, it was a long time more available, but Masayoff also said, we come to a point where the Asians are learning more about the kickboxing from the West and for the traditional Kung Fu you have to go to the West to learn instead of the other way around. So this change, this shift is actually happening. And I can see because the dedication of the Western people to learn the art is at this point higher than the people that live in Asia. They're more interested in the MMA and kickboxing at this time. This is the trend. And it's very hard to say that something is better or not, but to just judge somebody's skill on their ethnic, their ethnicity or their background, <coughs> that is really strange. It's just a Kung Fu means like you get skilled through hard work, you eat bitter. So everybody that does the work and gets really good, it doesn't matter what your background is. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I thought that I would not have been any, any good. <laughs> not saying that I'm very good, but, you know, it's like, no. So, in case somebody would like to learn more about the Five Ancestors, for example, where are you actually located in the Netherlands? Uh, I'm located in Horn, which is like a little bit above Amsterdam, about 30 kilometers. It's in the, uh, it's the, the, the province called North Holland, but everything, everybody knows where Amsterdam is. Um, the easiest way to contact me is through email. So the email uh, will probably be in the description. And if you want to learn from me or meet, there's also a lot of videos of uh, Master Yo Bo Hong on the Martian Man. Uh, Martian Man is also a YouTube channel that, that um, actually did uh, the camp where I met uh, uh, Sifu here. And that was actually quite a funny story because uh, we had the first martial camp. And then the organizer tells us the first person to register is a Shaolin monk with uh, his own temple. So everybody of us was like really like scared, like oh, this guy is really good and comes to test us. So I've been training, even I was in my bed, I wake up, I train harder just to prepare to <laughs> meet him. And it turned out he's a really nice guy, super skilled, really powerful. And then he gave us the opportunity to come to his temple to, to teach and share our knowledge. So I'm really happy it happened and also it made me jump in my skill level because of the nervous. <laughs> yes, but I'm happy everything turned out like this. If you want to know more, uh, Google about Master Yabo Hong. Um, to find me, you send me an email. And I basically, I arrange everything within Europe. Master Yabo is for Asia. And we love to share with the right people that really want to learn and have the dedication to do so. Yes. And is it also possible that you only teach in classes or are you open for private classes? So how could somebody imagine what type of training could they uh, receive from you? So basically I, I uh, have a few international students, they come privately, they visit me every once in a while. Um, I do have my normal classes and I do workshops so we can meet up and then you can at least get introduced to the skill and from there we can always talk how the training begins. 
uh, we'll give a lot of support and we want to spread the art out over several countries so if you from abroad you want to learn uh, we can always arrange to come over we train we can come to you you know that we are very flexible if the person has the right mindset we can do a lot with you what's the mindset about so what what type of mindset the people should have the people that really love martial arts they want to learn it and also share it they want to train themselves they want to push themselves to get to a high level so they can be of good representative uh, they must be people who don't like to go brawling and uh, proving that oh look uh, my martial art is better than yours you know we just want people that generally love kung fu have been training it their whole lives or want to train it their whole lives and, and grow and share and just be uh, I said it's an ambassador for, for the style. Yes. So that's what I call the people with the right mindset. Not somebody who just wants to learn a trick and become stronger and then do it, put it in his own martial art or something like that. We, we don't like those people too much. Good. Anything else you would like to share with the people right now? Uh, uh, basically, just like if you do the martial arts, whatever style you're training, whatever it is, as long as it gives you a certain feeling of happiness and enjoyment, just continue. Uh, if you have a certain wish to meet a certain master of a little certain skill, put the wish out there, you know, put the intent out, and when the time is right, you will meet, you will meet the right person. Uh, yeah, basically the, the people that really are very nice and very good in the martial arts world, they have a certain way of acting and behaving. Um, you will find out soon enough. If somebody is grumpy all day, he cannot be like a very spiritual person, <laughs> in my opinion. Yes. Or you just catch him at the wrong moments all the time. That could also be possible. But to me, a person that's always like, or not always, but most of the time happy and sharing and just a, a nice person to be around, that are the ones that, that you should be uh, looking for. In my opinion. Thank you so much. Linda, thank you also for your time. Well, like I said, this is like not the most usual tea talk that we have because actually we are surrounded here with quite a lot of more people and therefore we just spontaneously decided to be open for any type of questions that we want to answer or, or that you are interested in. So feel free to ask Sifu Linden if you are having anything that you would like to know. Why is it called Five Ancestors ah. Kung Fu? So Five Ancestors Kung Fu, the line that I'm happy to be part of, is um, the Chicken Tong line, is Master Chicken Tong uh, spread it through Malaysia. And the Five Ancestors that he taught was Damo, which is Bodhiharma, which gives us the internal part of breathing, the stretching exercise, the body change, and that that uh, sort of thing. Then the second ancestor we say is Lohan. Lohan uses like a ball in a chain of more roundish movements. He charts up the chain and then he shoots out the power like 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 uh, like this. Then you have the Taisu or Daisu, which is the big ancestor. He used to be a general that became an emperor. He is like somebody wearing heavy harness and to have two swords. He basically is very linear and he makes a lot of chopping and stabbing movements. And it's quite quite linear, quite hard, but still internal. And after that you get the white crane. The white crane is like a it's not a crane is not a strong animal, so he doesn't like to fight power head on, so he likes to be more evasive, and very explosive. So he just likes to wait for the opportunity and then try to, to land a, a sniper shot. Then the fifth already, yeah. Then the fifth ancestor is a monkey. Monkey is quite playful. It's a small animal. You try to catch him, he go on your head, he knock you, he pull your ear. You know, he play with you. But if you upset him, then he will really go for your eyes and hurt you. And this way, but monkey, <laughs> basically, all the time, I like monkey a lot. I can be playful and not have to hurt somebody. You know, but it's nice. But the monkey can really hurt you if he wants to. But he can choose not to. So basically, those are the the five ancestors that we train in. Then we also have a sixth ancestor, which will be a roommate or name you. She's like a very advanced way of using crane and using the intent. 
So she has a very special style, very explosive, very loose, but it's a lot of elegance and then sudden kill. Yeah, every move in Wu Mei is to hurt or kill. She don't play. Wu Mei don't play. That's what I like practicing because of the energy. And do these um, different ancestors require different like amount of energy? Yes, the low Han and the Taizu tend to be quite direct. They're, they're strong, they want to go in and forth. One is round, other is linear. Like I said, the white crane is more like he's waiting for the right moment. And then we snipe you when you can. The monkey is playful. And Damo is the internal practice that brings everything together. So they have energies are different. The one person will like one ancestor more than the others. But I can switch. I like monkey and crane a lot. But then again, if I feel like to, if somebody gives me too much power, I turn into Aisu or I hit them with a low hand. So I can change, but the most playful I think is white crane and monkey together. Thank you. I have another question regarding the energy. So with all the trainings you are trying to create or cultivating the energy, yeah. and maybe if you are a person, maybe you are sick or you are having low energy, how is, is it possible or how to store these, these energies? Is it uh, possible? Yes. Well, storing energy is not, not a good thing. It's like you, when you store it, it's not stops moving. It's like water. If it stops moving, it gets stagnant and it starts to you know, turn bad. Same with energy, if I gather a lot of energy and I store it, and I keep it stored, it becomes stag stagnant and it will actually make me sick. So what you want is you want to learn how to increase your energy flow, how to let the energy flow more through the body. And then, if you store it, let's say I store a lot of energy, then I can use it for something, or I blast it, or I just keep it to myself and just put it in the body, or heal something. But you cannot just build and store it and keep it there because it will make you sick. The stagnant energy is very, very unhealthy. Yes. Some arts they practice the build of energy, but they don't do anything with it, which is, in my eyes, not so good for your health. Yes. How do you know that you're storing energy? Is, is there the way to recognize that, because most, most of it is probably unconscious. Yes, like let's say you have trained your energy, and then afterwards you're still like jumpy, you, know, you still feel like you want to do something, then you notice the energy is still present, so you have to learn how to calm it out, to how to let it out. Usually the easiest way is breathe it out, or ground it, open the yung chin and just let it out uh, through the feet. Yes. So when you notice, like still there, like the jumpy energy, try to bring it down and try to let it go. So it's easily said, but you need to practice. Do you recommend Kung Fu also for sick people, having a disease or something like that, to get the stagnant energy flowing again? Uh, yes. Do you train with the sick people? Not so much the sick people, but I do have, well, actually one of my friends, he was very sick, he had uh, five chemotherapies, and then when he got out of bed, he was so painful, and then he walked like this, then he stand on the floor, he empty out all the, 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 the stagnant energy, he fill up, he stand up straight, and then he walked, even the doctor was like, how did you do that? He said, well, I just like renewed my energy, like, like I let the old out, put it in. The doctor was so surprised, but the doctor did not ask him, like, hey, can you show me how can I teach this to my other patients or anything? He's just surprised at them. That's it, you know, so that, that is a shame. But yes, the, the people that are sick, they benefit a lot from the uh, knowing, because for us, we, uh, as I'm healthy, for me, it's just energy boost. I feel happy, I feel strong, but some of the people we know uh, that had problems and they did the exercise, the problems got less. And to them, it's the difference between not being able to function and being able to function. So to me, also a motivation to keep training this, especially the Yan Shogong system, the, the Nei Kung system that we have for health. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yan Shogong means actually the health of longevity, of a long and good life. So yes, I really recommend people that are, have some problems to start at least the Yan Shogong. Yes, which is very good for the, for the health, or another very good making system.
Can you maybe tell us a little bit about um, Masya, his backstory, where he learned uh, the system, uh, where, where he got it from? Just a short time. So, so Master Yap is the son of the late Master Yap Ching Hai, which was the first student of uh, uh, Master Chi Kyung Tong from Malaysia. Uh, both of them are legends in their own, own, in their own way. Um, what I know of Master Yap Ching Hai, he was a Feng Shui master, a Kung Fu master, and also a master in the Buddhism, or, um, at least if I uh, have it correctly. Um, then master, he divided through his three sons, uh, Master Yap got the Kung Fu part and he has been training all his life also with Master Chi Kim Tong and also Master Han uh, from the UK so those are the, quite the senior ones and uh, Master Han is still around luckily uh, he's retired but uh, the most powerful person I've ever met that's Master Han yes. um, so Master Yap has learned a lot from, from them and then he was one day looking like, okay, I'm very good at this, but how come? What makes it that I, I can do this and the other person cannot? So he was analyzing, he's a pensionized IT specialist, an analyst and also a, a, a mathematic uh, expert. So he was always looking at how do I do this, how do you make schedules, do you use this point, now go to this point, let this go, drop this. So by exactly giving you the map to, to, to go, we make something complicated into like, like something very easy to to take. So he can take off, like in one year, you can cover a full year of material and get it out. And I can also reproduce, like some of the people that have been training this week already changed, changed a lot just by the right uh, uh, knowledge. So yes, Masiyop has been training all his life. His father was also a grandmaster. And especially the way of, of teaching uh, make him so special. And he's like the only one in the, in the world that now is like, uh, the highest or the, the, the best in the Wumei system, then he's about here, then the next person in line is me about here, then there's a one or two more, but we are building more people, and uh, I'm very happy to be able to follow him because his skill level also keeps growing, and every time I think I reach a new level, <laughs> he showed me there's another level, and then he showed me that so he's actually like not on the mountain but on a spaceship on another planet. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, to me he's, he's very special and we have like a father and son uh, relationship. And uh, I'm very happy that, that he, he wants to teach me also in the, the way. Thank you very much. Anything left? Wonderful. So once again, Lynn, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for sharing everything you know. Uh, yeah, let's continue sharing. Yes. And see you later next year here again. Oh, that's really awesome. Yes, I love being here. I love sharing with the people. It's such a nice, such a nice people. It's like you know, just being here. I would even you know come and pay to, to come here, you know, because I love this, I love this so much, the tempo, the people, the, the atmosphere, yeah, uh, it's a shame I have to go back home, there are also people there depending on me, <laughs> if not I would have stayed. <laughs> Good, yes. Good, thank you all for watching, and have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, and see you soon again.